In this short video, we're going to talk about integrals of vector functions. Now, if we have a vector function with three component functions, f of t, g of t, and h of t, the integral, so the definite integral of r of t from t equals a to t, t equals b is just defined by taking the definite integral of each of the component functions. So the definite integral of the vector function is just going to be the vector where you have found the definite integral with the same bounds of integration of each one of the component functions. And then if capital R of t is an antiderivative of R of t, then you can use this form of the fundamental theorem of calculus so that the definite integral of r lowercase r of t from a to b is just uppercase r evaluated at b minus uppercase r evaluated at a. And the most general antiderivative of uh, a vector function is while well, you take any antiderivative, and just a reminder, antiderivative means that the derivative of capital R is going to be lowercase r. So you just find any antiderivative, and then you have to add not a constant, but a constant vector. So that's the only other difference that we have to be careful about, that each one of your component functions, it could have a different constant of integration, and we put them together in a constant vector of integration. So let's go through some examples. Here we have the definite integral of the vector function with components sine t, cosine t, and 2t. So you don't have to do them one by one. You could just uh, find the antiderivative as a vector. But just to be careful, I'm going to do them one component at a time. So the ith component will take the definite integral of sine t dt from 0 to pi. Uh, antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And then we'll evaluate that carefully. A lot of minus signs in there, but it winds up being 2. And I always tell my uh, calculus classes, first semester, second semester, third semester, this to me is an amazing result. Absolutely amazing. You take a transcendental function, sine of t, your bounds of integration are transcendental. You're going from 0 to pi. In fact, this is the area under one arch of the sine function. And it turns out to be an integer. Two. That's just amazing. Maybe we can make sense of this later in the course. All right, let's move on to the next component. The jth component, uh, finding the antiderivative of cosine is just sine, evaluating between zero and pi, we get zero. And then for uh, the kth component, uh, antiderivative of 2t would be t squared, and we'll evaluate that between zero and pi to get pi squared. So the value of that derivative, I mean, sorry, the value of that integral is going to be a vector with components 2, 0, and pi squared. All right, now here in this example, we're asked to find the most general antiderivative of this vector function with only two components. That's fine. It doesn't really matter whether we have two components or three components. Uh, the method is still going to be the same. And so I'll need to find antiderivatives of each component. And we'll have to take a trip down memory lane here. For the ith component, we have to find the antiderivative natural log of t. And uh, if you recall from Calc 2, the way you do that is using integration by parts. We had this formula at the integral of u dv equals uv minus the integral of v du. And in this case, we're going to let u be the natural log of t. So du is 1 over t dt. We're going to let dv equal just dt. So the antiderivative there, v, would equal t. 
So then let's just put it into the formula then. So I'll have uv, that's my t, natural log t. And then this should be a minus. I have no idea why I have a plus here. So let me fix that. minus uh, V du. So that'd be T times one over T dt. And so I better fix this again. It does have a minus. And now we just find the antiderivative. And finally, I got it right at the end. So plus C1. Now we'll do the uh, jth component function, take its antiderivative. Uh, with this one, we just need a u substitution. If u equals the natural log of t, then du is 1 over t dt. So uh, making my change to u, uh, the 1 over t dt is just going to be d, du, and 1 over natural log of t will be 1 over u. And the antiderivative of 1 over u du is the natural log of the absolute value of u. And then the most general one means we have to add this constant of integration. But it's a different one from the one we had in the other component. And changing back to t, that would be the natural log of the absolute value of the natural log of t. And then uh, plus my constant of integration. So the most general antiderivative is going to be my anti vector of antiderivatives plus a constant vector of integration. All right, so here we're going to look for uh, our specific constants because what we're given is r prime. We're given the derivative. We're given an initial condition. And we'd like to find the original function. Well, I can start by taking the antiderivative of r prime. I'll have to find the most general antiderivative. And then I'll have to find what the value should be for the co vector constant of integration. So let's put that down in writing. What is our strategy? Find the most general antiderivative of r prime. So let me just emphasize that. Look, we find the most general antiderivative of r prime of t. And then we're going to use the given initial condition to find the value of the constant vector of integration. So first, the most general antiderivative. There's no uh, need to go into any fancy techniques of integration for these component functions. My first component function is just one. It's just one i. So the antiderivative is t plus c1. And the second component, I've got um, well, t cubed. Its antiderivative is 1 fourth t to the fourth plus a second constant of integration. And then the kth component, the antiderivative sign is negative cosine. So my most general antiderivative is the vector with components t, 1 fourth t to the fourth minus cosine of t. And then we have to add this constant vector. So let's find out what c1, c2, and c3 have to be in order for my initial condition to be true. So r, when t equals 0, has to have the vector with components 2, negative 1, and 3. So let me go ahead and put 0 in the place of t and my three component functions. Now it'll give me a 0, another 0. But remember, cosine of 0 is 1. So that would give me negative 1 plus c1, c2, and c3. So c1 and c2 are straightforward. c1 has to equal 2, and c2 has to equal negative 1, because I'm just adding 0. But here I've got this negative 1, so let me work this out carefully. In the third component, I have 3 equals, so 3 equals negative 1 plus c3. 
All right, so solve that for C3, and I find C3 equals 4. So now I know what I can put down for my original function. My R of t then must be t, 1 fourth t to the fourth. No, it's not. Sometimes I forget things. I forgot that everybody has a value for C. Everybody has a value of C. Let's do that correctly now. So it's T plus C1, which was 2. So T plus 2. And then 1 fourth T to the fourth plus C2. So that'd be minus 1. And now we can put minus cosine of t plus c4, which is not c3. Oh, plus c3, which equals 4. Good. All right, so we'll be applying the vector, uh, vector integration in our next chapter, but for now, that's all there is to it.